the man, our lunch and speaker, Herman Denny Farrell.
my father and mother moved in there in 1940, and the rent was $100 a month, which was a lot of money in those days. And as I said, when we ended up in the other building, the rent went down to 69. The reason that happened was because my father joined the Navy and went into the war, and we couldn't afford without the, the housekeeping, without my father's income, because the Army sent you $20 a month in those days. I'm giving you a lot of history here. <laughs> $20 a month you got if you were in the Army. And so the $20, we couldn't afford the rent, so we moved to the other place. So I knew about housing, and I knew about leads from a kid. So as it was said, I was driving cabs and doing all sorts of other silly things. And I went to a political club, and a very dear friend of mine was uh, doing, did a lot of housing work. He became the assemblyman. His name was Steve Gottlieb. He became a judge. Steve would go into court, and by this time I was working. I'd gotten a political job, and I was working in a, uh, in a court. I was working in the Supreme Court, and uh, that's where I met Shelley Silver. And uh, while we were working there, every now and then, Steve would call me and say, do me a favor, some tenants from 930 St. Nicholas are going down to the court and I'm up in Albany, can you go in and just tell the judge to adjourn it for a couple of days because I'm going to, I'll be down. So I'd go down and, and the PM, when we get there, I'd be talking to the tenants and it would be a lack of heat and everything else. So the judge would say, yeah, well, what's happening? And I'd say, sir, um, Mr. Gottlieb can't come with blah, 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 blah. But he said, what's the issue here, tenants? And the tenants would, I'd say, Your Honor, you know, it's the fact they're not getting heat. This landlord doesn't give us heat. We're thinking, we went up, we're thinking of going on a rent strike, blah, 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 and back and forth. So I kept doing this, and then I started reading the laws, because I had to learn, you know, what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I began to realize you couldn't do certain things, the rents when the heat had to come on. In those years, you had to turn the heat on. You didn't have to turn it on until October 15th. So if it was zero degrees on October 10th, they didn't turn the heat on. All those wonderful things. So I was doing that, so I began to learn about housing. In 72, the Far East went crazy, and oil went from 25 cents a gallon to a dollar a gallon, then a dollar fifty a gallon. That was the beginning of the end. The landlords that did not have the ability to raise the money to pay the rent, to pay the, for the oil, they stopped doing the heat. And you had more and more buildings throughout the city without heat. And what it was was a lot of the buildings of the type that we're talking about, walk-ups, low-income, Lower East Side, the fathers of the women, because the women outlived the men, own those buildings. In the 70s, most of the buildings were owned by people who were in Florida, mm -hmm. or who were doctors and lawyers. Their husbands, their fathers, were bought the building, did the work, and everybody talked belovedly of the father. Oh, when he was a soup, and he would come up and give me a new refrigerator, he'd carry it himself. And there was never a house without heat. But he's dead and gone. He left it to his children. His children now are every place but New York City. You have agents running the building. <coughs> and the building, they're running them and they're running them. And then finally, there's not enough money to pay for the oil and pay for themselves. So they usually would send, and they're now getting notices from the courts or from the city saying you're going to get this violation, you're getting that violation. And they would call up and say, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, we can no longer rec 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 work for you. And by the way, they're going to arrest you next week. <laughs> so these people would say, oh boy, they would sell it to anybody. So you began to have a change. And that's when I had gotten elected, because I continued to do the things I was doing as a tenant advocate, which then got me elected to the district leadership. Then I became an assembly person. At the same time, I'm running about 30 buildings that I'm actually working with people. And in those days, I had a rule. I would help you help yourself. And I would say to the tenants, 
you come, we'll work, but you have to do it. I will tell you what has to be done, but you have to do it. I'm not going to do it for you. And there was always a strong woman, not men. There were always strong women who would come in and start to do this. And they'd take care of the making the correct, collecting the rent. Now, one of the things I did on the rent strike was very simple. If we went on a rent strike, you had to buy money order checks every month. Because <clears throat> my rule was, we will have checks, but I'm not going to have you write your own check. Why not? Because you'll spend out from under. That check won't be worth about three miles. <laughs> so you have to have checks that are person. You know the money is there. So I tell them to go. Don't go to the city. Don't go to the post office because you'll never find out who. If you had to check the check, you could never do it. So go to a bank and get checks, and then we get them. And I'd say, I would speak on behalf, I never said represent, I will speak on behalf of those of you that are part of the red strike. Then my friend Steve Gottlieb was the backup. So we'd go down 110, we start the landlord, say, he's not a lawyer. I'd say, if you want, we'll have a lawyer in here. Every now and then I have to bring a lawyer in at 1 o'clock, and, and none of the landlords wanted the lawyer. They didn't want you to go to court because they knew they were wrong and they were going to lose. So we would usually negotiate, and if they did the work, I would give them the money. You know, all right, you put your oil in. Then one day, a young man by the name of Doug Kellner came into my club, and Doug came in, and my political club was a black club. And, um, but it wasn't really black. There was Dave Dinkins' club which was really black. Ray Jones was there. Mine was mixed. And he lived at 646 West 153rd Street, which is Columbia's building, Columbia University. He went, and he went to Doug, they didn't think he's his club, and they said, no, you've got to go to the white club. And they sent him to my club. <laughs> so Doug Kelder came in, and I said, Doug, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to law school. I said, do they still give you Fridays off? He says, yeah. I said, good, you'll go to court with me on Friday. <laughs> he today makes, if you've got a really bad case for the landlord, his firm is now one of the biggest firms in doing <coughs> fighting landlords. So I mean, he's very good. But at that time, he wasn't even a lawyer yet. And we would go in on these cases. And slowly but surely, he one day came to me and he said, Jenny, there's a thing called 7A. I said, what's 7A? He says, Article 7A, blah, blah. you can take the building from the landlord. I said, what? He said, you can take the building from the landlord. I said, oh, okay. Let's try it. <laughs> and we started taking buildings away. At one point, we had 75 buildings in Washington Heights. Oh, 75 buildings. A matter of fact, I remember one guy, I went to, he lived 515 with some Street. I remember all of these things. I, I went to the guy and I said, I knew the, the owner. I knew him when I saw him, and I said, you know, I'm taking your building from you. We're going to court. He said, you can have it. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you can have it? He said, I'll give it to you. I said, will you come and tell the judge that? He said, you're going to drive me down? I said, no, I'll get you a taxi. <laughs> and he came in, and he told the judge, and we went through the procedure, because you couldn't just do it that way with a dollar and all the things we did. That building, to this day, is still a co-op owned by the tenants because of that. But we took a lot of the buildings. Now, in the process, I began to realize when you have 70 buildings and you're floating them, and I'm now running up to Albany, I said, we've got to come up with something. And that's where it suddenly dawned on me that we needed a management company who worked on behalf of the tenants, not on behalf of the landlords. And that's when I said, we need some form of a mechanism. So I mentioned a lady by the name of Sharon Lauer. And at that time, I was then on the housing committee. And I was, I think, the chair of the subcommittee of the preservation community. So then we started. But at the same time, New York City, every place was being abandoned. As I said, in my community, you had to show me the rent. And I had to have that money, not money, but the money order. I never wanted money. 
and it was made, the checks were made out to the person who gave it to me, which meant I could hold it, but I couldn't spend it. They had decided to spend it, to give it to the landlord. They didn't do that in the Bronx. They didn't do that in Brooklyn. The Bronx was the worst. So pay, people turned not paying your rent into a way to save money, not to get the housing. And that's why, I don't know how many people are here from the Bronx, you had the amount of abandoned houses you had. But the way we did it, we didn't tend to have that happen. But they still needed to have management to help them. So there was a movement. I think Todd should now come into office. And there was a movement to create a third entity, entity which would be a housing czar to take the abandoned houses over. And Pete Gratis, Assemblyman Pete Gratis, supported that position. I, on the other hand, said, we're going to create a company to own the buildings and give them to the tenants. The tenants will own the building, because I said, I'm not creating another czar, because the czar isn't going to do what we want them to do, and they won't listen to the tenants. So we had this big fight, not physical fight, but political fight. Came close to physical. <laughs> Housing does bring up your. <laughs> and so we we all had a major argument. I had to work and talk to the individual members because you had to. It's very rare that this happens. Usually the chairman of, of the committee takes the committee, tells you what you want, and you say yes, okay. But this time it was a battle. Ed Lehner was then the chair. So I said I was the chair of the committee, the Neighborhood Preservation Committee, that's why the name Neighborhood Preservation Corporation. And we had a vote. And I won the vote by, I think, one or two votes. And that's when the law was written. At the same time, the governor, actually ahead of it, had put in the budget a half a million dollars for my company because I had set up the first company that I'm to keep in Upper Manhattan. They gave me a half a million to do that. He then, if I forget, it was about two and a half million the second, the first payment. So that, I think, it was, and you said it was uh, 1978. It was 1978. Yeah, because it was just about the time he was going to get re-elected. He, he was running for re-election. Uh, was a, we were able to talk him into going with the bill. And that's how the neighborhood preservation came about. So as I said, it was not a very, you know, and I don't mean to, but okay, there was a lot of work involved in, behind, in, involved in it. Today, I look at the houses, I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago, I think somebody looked at my schedule and said, what are you, you're, getting done, you're doing this, I said, yeah. And I started talking about some of this stuff. And I can talk for years on this. And, it's, and I pointed out that in that period, we only lost two buildings in northern Manhattan. And one of them was um, 30, 60, St. Nicholas Place. The people came to me with three people left. And there was no other way I could help them. They only had three tenants in there. You couldn't keep that, but it ended up being closed off. It's open again now. They rebuilt it. And there was another one on 56th Street between Amsterdam and Broadway where the building got a crack in it. Uh, and, and they had to tear the building down. It's now a playground for children for the buildings on the inside. But all of the other buildings that we put together, all of them are still in place. Some of them, they kept the building. Some of them, they gave them to the city. And the city, I forget the program they have, they, they let them run it. The only problem we're having today, because I've been in the legislature 38 years, so imagine if you were a lady working you were the, in your 50s, you're now 38, you're now 50, 88 years old. But, but they're still alive and they still talk. And I go to a lot of the buildings. The, problem, the only problem we have was many of the buildings didn't raise their rents. They, 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 and when I say they didn't raise their rents, I, God forbid I say raise rents. You know? <laughs> the barrel in favor of raising rents. <laughs> 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 we are supported by the editorial supporting. 
<laughs> but no, but you know you have to. So they're still paying 1977-78 rents, and the, and the city has been subsidizing it for a long time, and now they're beginning to fight because the city's saying no. And some of the people are in there are the children of the people that I worked with, because as I said, it was always the women, it was always the older women that would say who would end up coming to my office. So we're always having to fight to make sure the tenants have the housing that they need. That these programs give you professional people, because you become professionals, who can then talk to the tenants and work on behalf of the tenants, and that is so important, because as I said, when my father got evicted, there was nobody talking on behalf of him, except the moving man who did <laughs> we'd sit outside and we'd give out a number and they used to have a moving man who would, but those judges were quick to say you got a weak boo type of thing. So it's a pleasure to be here and be with people who have worked on behalf of people that we think so much we help. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. 